Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on the business case for High Trust E1. My name is Kendall Morris with Risk360. Uh, and today we'll be hearing from Christian White, who's our president and co-founder, as well as Gary Holverson, who is one of our High Trust consultants. Uh, I did want to point you to the GoToWebinar control panel. In there, we have a couple of handouts for a couple of high trust materials that Christian and Gary will be talking about today as well as a section for questions. So if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to drop them there. And then we have some time at the end set aside for uh, Gary and Christian to answer those. But in the meantime, I'll hand it off to them to kick us off. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today we're gonna talk about High Trust's newest offering, uh, the High Trust E1 assessment and certification. So let's get started. This is our agenda for today. We're gonna open up just talking about what High Trust E1 is, comparing some of the differences between High Trust E1 and the I1 offering, as well as uh, SOC 2. Um, we'll talk a little bit about market drivers that we think are pertinent for E1, and then we'll jump into the business case for E1. We'll talk about some of the benefits, um, attributes, how it may pair well with SOC 2 if you do SOC 2. Um, how to communicate with the executive team and maximize your ROI. And um, like Kendall mentioned, there's some handouts that we're going to talk about. We'll get into a real world case study and then talk about some other considerations, um, additional resources, and do QA. So, with that, let's jump into it. All right. So, what is the new High Trust E1? <clears throat> so, this is a an essential one-year assessment is a certifiable assessment and of course governed by the high trust alliance it's modeled on the cisa cisa cyber essentials uh, also the health industry Cybersecurity practices or hicp it also includes some nist 171 which are basic requirements protecting un protecting controlled unclassified information and NIST IR7621, which is for small businesses. So this is a, the E1 is a fixed measurement of implementation. Um, and this was updated and added as of January, 2023. Uh, it requires scoring and evidence for 44 requirement statements. <clears throat> uh, these statements are nested in the implemented one-year assessment referred to as the I1, and also the risk-based two-year assessment referred to as the R2. And what this means to you is there's no wasted effort as your organization matures to a larger assessment. Um, additionally, there's a readiness assessment as well as a validated assessment. So the readiness assessment, when it's done in the high trust MyCSF portal with a high trust subscription, leads to a high trust report, whereas the validated assessment can lead to a high trust certification. So a validated assessment must be done by an approved high trust external assessor, such as RISC 360. Now the, the E1 certification or assessment provides a basic fundamental level of information security assurance to clients, company officers, board members, investors, as well as merger and acquisition partners. Yeah, Gary so, uh, Gary, so you mentioned um, really this year is the first year that High Trust has further reduced those barriers to getting High Trust certification. Um, back in the day, it was just the R2, you know, the uh, risk based uh, two year validated assessment, which was, is pretty robust for most organizations. Um, if you don't have an information security program or you do have one, but you haven't gone through any certifications or audits before, it's, it's a huge lift. And then High Trust came out with the I1 offering, which reduced uh, you know, barriers to entry. And the I1 was intended to be a moderate level of assurance. Well, now, as of this year, you know, we, we now have the E1 offering, which is further reduced the barriers to achieving High Trust certification. And is just covering the essentials or a basic level of assurance, like you mentioned. Yeah, and it, it kind of maps that out in that uh, Venn diagram. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about so what's in the E1. Of course, we can't tell you all the requirement statements, but we can tell you kind of the domains that they map across. 
So when the E1 was released, uh, it showed 44 requirement statements. These are grouped across 19, what I like to call responsibility domains. <clears throat> That's my term, not high trusts. These are largely a group of similar assets and the responsibility for these assets. Typically, the responsibility domains align with individual policies or a subsection of a large policy document. Of course, every organization distributes their responsibilities differently, but it's a good place to start uh, for identifying the subject matter expert and demonstrating implementation of the requirement statements. Gary, you mentioned those different sources that were used in considering, uh, you know, when, when high trust considered when building the 44 requirement statements, and you can tell you know, they did a, a risk-based approach to that. You can see access control, obviously that's a big one. Um, so the majority, uh, or that, that has the largest amount of requirement statements, but also vulnerability management, audit and monitoring, um, and a few others. Um, whereas, you know, for information protection program, you know, we're just focusing on the essentials and that's that requirement statements mostly related to policy and, and program governance. So just an interesting distribution, the way that um, I trust chose to structure this. That's right. Okay, so this graph is a comparison of the distribution requirements between uh, dis distribution of requirement statements in an E1 and I'm comparing it to an I1. And you can see that the distribution ratio of the requirements um, is pretty similar across the responsibility domains. There's of course more requirement statements in an I1, but the E1 is a great starting point to move later into an I1. <clears throat> the E1 will give you information, your information security team experience working with the MyCSF domains as well as with the MyCSF portal. Now keep in mind, many of the E1 requirement statements are measured against a policy or procedure document. In fact, um, I've identified at least 11 of the 19 responsibility domains in the E1 that require a policy or a process document to score the implementation. The question will be, does the implementation meet uh, the requirements or the, the, the process described in the formal documentation? Okay, so there are fewer standards that are required to be documented. Like you mentioned too, uh, you, for, for some organizations, E1 will be, you know, their first step into high trust. It might also be, as far as they go, there might not be a need for them to build upon that and go to an I1. For other organizations, based on you know, market forces, maybe customer requirements, they might eventually need to mature and build upon that to achieve I-1 certification. But um, the intent was for the E-1 to, to be uh, available to both of those scenarios. So I think for a lot of firms, you know, they'll, they'll achieve an E-1 and be satisfied with that um, and may choose to stay there. It's a great place to start. This slide, uh, so what we wanted to communicate here is how High Trust E1 and SOC 2 um, may pair together. Um, so what we did here is we took uh, those 44 requirement statements from the previous slide, and then we matched those against a typical SOC 2 control set for security. And we said, all right, out of those 44 requirement statements, how many do we think are already covered under a SOC 2 control set. Now with SOC 2, uh, remember that the AICPA governs the, the SOC 2 program and they define criteria, but not the control set. So organizations typically have customized SOC 2 controls. Um, so when we say a typical SOC 2, we're, out of the ones that we typically see, we feel that this is what the overlap would look like. Where there's not overlap, that's because high trust requirement statements are more technical or the, the, the burden of implementation might be a little bit greater or they're just not ones that we would typically see in a SOC 2 control set. Um, and we'll get, we'll get into the details on this in a little bit. All right, let's talk about uh, market drivers. So I'll build this slide, but really we think related to E1, there's three primary market drivers for why organizations may wanna consider high trust E1 certification. Uh, the first is vendor management or third-party risk management. 
Um, a lot of organizations have vendor management programs and they require vendor questionnaires to be filled out. They require uh, different security certifications or reports. And we think uh, E1 will end up being uh, something very applicable to organizations trying to um, get into the healthcare vertical or demonstrate to their partners that they do have a, a foundational security program. And they'll use that E1 certification um, as a means of demonstrating that and maybe avoiding security questionnaires altogether, which I know would be nice. Um, the second uh, primary market driver is for competitive advantage reasons. So companies that might already have a SOC 2 or an ISO 27001 certification might be interested in adding a, um, a certification that speaks directly to the healthcare uh, industry. And this is a good opportunity uh, to demonstrate that. And then lastly, trust and transparency. Having a third party uh, attestation, uh, you know, report and certification that demonstrates that, yes, we have a uh, foundational information security program in place. Here's our certification. Um, so those are kind of some of our thoughts as we considered, you know, for E1 specifically, what do we think some of those primary drivers are? All right, CW, do you think an E1 would benefit a company that's uh, a candidate for merger or acquisition? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, more and more, we're seeing boards of directors and investors be interested in cybersecurity programs um, as a means of both building continuity uh, into those companies and feeling good about the way the company is managing risk. And so um, in a lot of M&A due diligence, uh, these are increasingly becoming things that investors want to consider and see how the company has built their information security program because they want their investment protected. Good point. Let's jump into the business case now. All right, so what are some of the benefits of E1 certification and why may it make sense for organizations to invest the time going down this path? Um, so like we mentioned, high trust has been around a long time. It's widely recognized, especially in the healthcare space uh, for third-party information assurance. And we think E1 is readily achievable for any organization. You know, 44 requirement statements is, is not a lot. It covers the things that are really important that companies should be doing anyways. So it really is kind of a natural um, certification to kind of ease into to demonstrate what you are already doing as an organization. Uh, we talked a little bit about building trust, streamlining some of the due diligence in the, in the sales cycle and the fact that E1 maps very well to multiple frameworks because when you take any framework and it probably is covering the, the essentials of cybersecurity in addition uh, to other things. Yep, we talked about it being essential. The E stands for essential, one stands for one year. Um, and again, this is a fundamental level of information assurance. And um, we'll talk a little bit about um, SOC 2 in a second here and why that particular one we think pairs very well. Okay, <clears throat> so the, uh, for the E1, the best practices are standardized and aligned from multiple frameworks. Um, so you're, to begin with, your company defines the scope of the assessment. So what, what's the infrastructure that's in scope or the piece of software that you're developing or the people that are in scope, or the processes, or the data that you want to focus on the protection of. <clears throat> so you may want to start with one system and then grow to other systems if you're developing or offering multiple systems. So the, of course, as I said before, the examination and reporting must be done by an approved high trust external assessor. Uh, it's an opportunity to demonstrate information security alignment across multiple frameworks. And uh, the High Trust Alliance prescribes 44 requirement statements for uh, for the E1, and they're modeled on the following industry standards. As I said before, uh, CISA Cyber Essentials, uh, HICP, which is Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices, NIST 171, Protecting Controlled Unclassified Information, and NIST IR 7621 for uh, Small Business Information Security. I think it's worth mentioning too, you know, that first bullet about the scope. Scope's very important. 
um, it is definable by the organization and the way that high trust describes um, you know what can be assessed it should be an implemented system so something that's already in place and that could be an entire business it could be a product group it could be um, a product and the parts of the company supporting that so that's always something that you know in the beginning of an assessment we're, we're discussing that in some cases organizations will choose to um, have an implemented system that includes one product and then they may choose to expand that scope over time uh, to include more products. Um, so there are some strategy discussions uh, related to scope. Okay, so the, the foundation for a strong information security and risk management program, of course, is gonna include implementation of a variety of controls. And the high trust certification demonstrates a well-rounded program built on categories of controls and these include administrative controls, such as your policies, uh, procedures, and training, your detective controls, such as system audit logs, preventative controls, such as firewalls, endpoint protection, email security, and multi-factor authentication, uh, and also corrective controls, such as vulnerability scanning and data backup and restoration testing. So all of these categories uh, are are encompassed in even the E1 with its 44 requirements. Uh, you're, you're building a defense in depth. So the benefits that HITRUST has over other frameworks, HITRUST updates its framework attributes on an annual basis at a minimum, and additionally, uh, based on the current threat landscape as that changes throughout the year. So if, if a significant event occurs, uh, HITRUST might update their framework to reflect that and then the next time that becomes a version it would be included in the e1 yeah and that, that's not something we see a lot with other frameworks um i know iso 27001 you know had a recent update for 2022 but prior to that it had been i think since 2013 since they had the last major revision so um the fact that you know this is being reviewed updated uh assessed against the threat landscape makes you feel good that, hey, the, the program's current, the controls that we have in place for foundational security are also applicable. Right, High Trust has taken a long look at what's current, what's what's on the horizon, and applying that to their framework. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, High Trust E1 and SOC 2. So um, specifically for companies that might already have a SOC 2 program, and they're considering, you know, hey, how might we integrate um, I trust E1 with our current program or tack that on. What does that look like? Is it a separate audit? Is it, you know, a new 100% lift? Um, so let's talk about some of those things. Um, so from our perspective and kind of doing research on this, we feel like for companies that are already SOC 2 compliant, have a SOC 2 program, have a report, implementing high trust e1 is going to feel like about a 25 percent incremental lift on top of what you're already doing um, specifically of, of of those 44 con, uh, requirement statements for e1 we assess that there's a 56 percent overlap um, with SOC 2 so in other words um, really there's only 19 net new requirement statements that would need to be implemented or assessed beyond SOC 2 so um, that, that's really nice because you know if you're, if you're going down the path of you know adding another um, information assurance uh, third party uh, attestation to your your suite of compliance um, initiatives it, it's best to not add a bunch of net new things that that don't pair well um, because you know that's going to take a lot more resources a lot more time a lot more cost and so we see this as, as pairing very nicely just due to the overlap um, we also think there's a lot of efficiencies to be had by combining these two under a single audit experience with two distinct reporting mechanisms. So what that looks like for companies being assessed is they have a single audit experience, they have a single evidence request list for all the things that the auditors need, and then the SOC 2 report is issued by the CPA firm such as RISC 360, we are a CPA firm, as well as uh, having some other designations. 
And then the high trust E1 certification, the assessment's still done by us as the high trust authorized external assessor, but the certification itself is issued by the high trust alliance. So it does take a little bit of coordination to, to provide that single audit experience, but for the companies that are being assessed under that, it is, a, it is really great. It's a great experience um, and you're not doing two different audits. So there's a lot of opportunity for value creation, reducing the time and effort that your team needs to be involved. Instead of doing two sets of walkthroughs, it's one set of walkthroughs. Um, so I, I think there's a really good opportunity to pair those two together. All right, so jumping into some of the business case things, uh, like Kendall mentioned at the beginning, we've got these two downloads that Gary and I created to be bespoke uh, to E1. Um, the idea behind the high trust E1 business case is in order to seek funding and communicate with management, um, you know, it's best to, to think through the business case and be able to speak in terms that, you know, executives like to hear. So we have this framework uh, within this PowerPoint deck that kind of walks you through, you know, what are the key things to consider um, for presenting the business case for E1? Um, you know, what is the cost benefit analysis? What are some FAQs that they're going to want to know? So we've pre-filled that out. So you can kind of look through that and see um, how that might relate to your organization. And then we also have an ROI calculator that's built out for E1 specifically um, and kind of uh, goes through some of those costs that you would um, consider, such as payments to High Trust Alliance for the MyCSF subscription and the actual validated assessment, as well as to your assessor. Um, we also, uh, I like to highlight, we have in there this ROIC principle. So um, I think a lot of businesses have, you know, a threshold for what they want to invest in. They need to see some sort of return on investment or return on invested capital over a period of time. So there's that calculation in there to kind of help you think through that in communicating with management. All right, let's jump into a real world scenario here. So uh, we've got an executive problem statement here. Acme Business Technology Company has been asked to achieve high trust certification as part of their strategy to move into the healthcare market. Um, the revenue organization is saying that beyond sales enablement and, and, and uh, showing a competitive differentiation the certification will also streamline third-party due diligence, so a faster sales cycle, reduce the number of security questionnaires that need to be filled out. Uh, I'll pause there. Uh, Gary, what, what kind of experiences do you have <laughs> with uh, security? Yeah, this, this draws directly to uh, some experiences I had uh, managing IT operations at the hospital. There was a piece of software that actually the, the president of the hospital and the radiology department wanted very badly to used to interact with the customers, but uh, the corporate holding uh, you know, holding organization said, okay, great, uh, your, your software vendor needs to fill out this questionnaire. And it was a 400 page Excel document, you know, laying out all of their security controls. Mm -hmm. So short story long, it took them, it took a year, it took over 12 months for them to implement whatever the controls were required and then report on it and complete this excel spreadsheet <clears throat> so it was over 12 months before we were able to install and and operate the software even mm -hmm. though it was going to be a huge uh, cost saving for the radiology department so yeah. at the end of that exercise our software cust our software vendor well they had one new customer and they had a gigantic spreadsheet they filled out if the e1 had been offered they may have been able to do that exercise in the high trust E1. And then at the end of that exercise, they would have had a certification rather than just a spreadsheet. Yeah. So big opportunities to do something once, apply it to a lot of the business development efforts and reduce the amount of time that the team spends filling out those questionnaires. That is, that is not fun. Um, so in this case, for this uh, you know use case here, the company already has a SOC 2 program. They're wondering you know how it aligns with High Trust, how they can gain some efficiencies by combining the two. Um, they want to know time, effort, cost, return on investment. They want to kind of see the the big picture here. So some of the asks from leadership are that hey, we need a budget estimate to figure out if this is something we can you know do this year. We need to understand what the project plan and the timeline is because we'll need to communicate that with prospective customers. 
We'd like to understand the opportunities for efficiency, you know, by using a single firm to, to do both of these under a single audit. And then what's the return on invested capital over the next 12 to 24 months? What, what kind of return can we expect by going down this path? Is it gonna make sense financially? So some of the expected benefits there, we've talked about some of these already, you know, building a competitive advantage, um, opportunities to sync timelines, reduce costs around compliance. Um, one of the nice things is, you know, really there should be no additional need for full-time employees to support an E1 effort on top of SOC 2. It's an incremental effort with incremental costs. Um, so what's the next step then for ACME? Well, we recommend jumping into the business case, jumping into the ROI calculator. Um, spending some time in there will help kind of paint a clear picture that then can be communicated to management to help them make those uh, important decisions on whether to move forward. All right, let's All right. jump into some other considerations here. Okay, so I want to talk about you know, where to begin. That's probably your first question. Um, you can start out with a readiness assessment with RISC 360, where that will produce a gap report that shows you what you need to work on. Um, the way we do that, we'll, we'll measure your, you know, kind of kind of the, the risk and where you are, and based on what's the what's the runway to get there. Does it require quotes, multiple vendors, uh, implementation, or is it a is it a policy document that someone can write up and uh, and and apply it towards high trust. So we help you to determine what to do first, which lever to pull first. It can be very overwhelming otherwise. Uh, additionally, if you don't have the internal team to build an information security program, uh, you might look to a, a virtual CISO situation. Uh, RISC 360 offers that to help uh, build and manage security and risk programs. And additionally, um, you would probably want to pair your E1 exercise with a GRC platform, something you could, a uh, software tool that you could use to manage your communication and your evidence collection. Uh, that And that's also helpful if you're combining that with a SOC 2, PCI, DSS, or ISO. Um, I, I think of the, you know, the, the, the SOC effort along with the high trust E1 as a Venn diagram with, I think you said, a 56% overlap. Yeah. So that, that would pair really well. Okay, the, so the first part would be, you know, once you've remediated your gaps and you think you're ready to go, evidence request and collection, uh, that's, that's best done in some sort of tool. Uh, the assessed entity can add, so for a, for a GRC tool, the assessed entity can add users to a dedicated GRC platform rather than communicating via email or adding external users to the company's internal file sharing directory. You know what we're talking about. We've seen permissions to share drives go wrong way too many times. Additionally, with a GRC tool, the assessed entity can assign tasks to team members and other subject matter experts and uh, collaborate within the tool as opposed to sending emails, which you don't want unencrypted emails going out with, uh, with your protected information. So for uh, evidence, evidence requests and collection, we also recommend using a GRC tool. The RISC 360 tool is called Phalanx. Uh, that, that streamlines the collection and testing. Evidence artifacts can be mapped to many requirements, and requirement statements can be mapped to many artifacts. And uh, I haven't figured out a, way, a good way to do that in a shared spreadsheet without waiting. To, you're, you're, you're majoring in the spreadsheet rather than the assessment. So the, the Phalanx tool can streamline evidence collection for multiple types of uh, assessments such as SOC, ISO, and high trust. Now, this is uh, demonstrating the, the GRC tool, Phalanx uh, multi-directional collaboration. Uh, you can get real-time metrics uh, that's available in Phalanx GRC dashboards. So there's no more formulas and spreadsheets and last minute calculations to build a chart before you have a project status meeting with all the stakeholders. And uh, within this, the team can comment on evidence with integration for email uh, and or Slack. Yeah, and I, I think one of the key things to note is just for those multi-framework type assessments, you know, we do a lot of single 
uh, we call it a single framework uh, strategy where you know, we're assessing organizations against multiple frameworks. Maybe it's ISOs 27001, PCI, SOC 2, High Trust. We're able to create that consolidated request list and on the back end of the platform, we're able to go ahead and assess and, and generate the reports or get that information you know, over to the High Trust platform uh, for submission. So. Um, it definitely helps to streamline a lot of the uh, work that would otherwise be manual or duplicative. Um, so let's highlight a few additional resources here. Um, we've got a, a YouTube channel uh, dedicated to high trust. Um, so that's available. We have a learning center on our website. Uh, we do a lot of blogs um, for high trust. And then also, you know, visit us at risk360.com. Hit the, the button, speak with an expert. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so these are additional resources uh, available to you as well. All right, Kendall, what do we got for uh, some Q&A? Any questions from the audience? Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. We did have a few questions come in. So uh, first one, um, what is the price of a high trust E1 assessment? Um, I can take that one. Uh, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> and the reason it depends is, is this a standalone assessment? Um, are you pairing this with another work stream? Uh, like I mentioned, because of the overlap with most major frameworks, there's usually some efficiencies there, both for the entity being assessed, um, as well as uh, us as the assessing entity. Um, if you're if you're just asking for costs, um, you know, for just E1 starting from scratch, depending on the readiness needs of the organization, I would probably budget somewhere in the ballpark of 35 to 50K um, as kind of just a good placeholder for that. Awesome. Um, another question here on the relationship between the I1, R2, and the E1. Um, is the E1, does that function as more of a required stepping stone to the others, or is it more of a, a standalone certification? Gary, you want that one? Sure. Of course, the E1 can be a standalone certification, and a lot of organizations will will operate that way. Um, it, like I said, it does result in a certification. Uh, it's more than it's it's different and more than just a report. Um, oftentimes, it'll depend on what their customers or stakeholders are requiring. How much, uh, you know, how what what level of assurance that they want to see. But at the same time, it's also a good starting point if if you need to reach an I1 or an R2. You know, recently we were working with a client. They were trying to achieve an I1. Um, we made a I made a chart for them and showed them, hey, you're like five requirements from having an E1, <clears throat> but you're much further from having an I1. Why don't you do an E1? Then you've got some a certification to offer. And then you can work towards your I1 while showing your stakeholders, hey, we got this certification from High Trust. Now we're going to continue to strengthen our process. That's a great point, Gary, because a lot of times, you know, the customers that are requiring a certain level of certification, um, they don't need it tomorrow, but they need to know that you're on some sort of maturity path to that. So E1 in that case can be a great stepping stone to demonstrate progress. You know, while you're on that 12 to 24 month path to to get to that higher level of assurance. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another question that came in here: Are there any differences in the incubation period for newly implemented or remediated controls on an E1 assessment compared to an I1 or an R2? So the the short answer is no. For an E1 assessment. The, the incubation or what we um, what we call a kind of kind of the bake in process uh, for newly implemented and remediated controls is 90 days. So that's the same as for an I1 and an R2. So with high trust, you have to demonstrate that this control has been operating for the 90 days. We're going to take a sample selection across that time period for the assessment. It's not just hey, what's the most recent one or show me one show me an instance where the control operated, it's over a period of time. So it's it's 90 days. I think that's important because, you know, the risk of not doing that is that 
it appears to be more of a point in time assessment. So you're not really assessing whether those controls are operating effectively over time, which I think is a reduced level of assurance. So, uh, you know, while that is one of the long poles in the tent for implementing E1, I, I think uh, it, it is a worthwhile one. All right. Uh, we had a couple other questions as well around the field work for the E1 assessment itself. So a couple of questions around, you know, how long does that field work take and is it evidence-based or just inquiry-based? If you can maybe dive into that a little bit as well. Uh, sure. The, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on your your uh, level of readiness, whether you've had a readiness assessment or not. Uh, but typically we say, what, um, what What do we typically state, CW? Well, I think, you know, if, if you're starting from scratch and you're trying to, you know, get through the readiness portion to figure out where your gaps are at, all right, now you've found your gaps, you know, if there are gaps uh, where you need to implement things, you know, you have to implement them, then you have to let them bake for 90 days before we can assess them. So when you start kind of building out that timeline that we have in the handout, you know, you start seeing, okay, well, maybe this is more of like a six to 12 month type of runway, uh, just based on, you know, where the gaps are at. But for us, once we begin the assessment, we have 90 days to, to, to complete the assessment, to submit that to high trust for their quality assurance review. And then um, the certification is issued after that once they've completed their review. Right. <clears throat> part of Kendall's, uh, Kendall, part of the question was, is evidence required and, and what would that look like? So just like an I-1 or R-2, uh, there's evidence required to support the implementation of the control uh, you know, for, for, for good scores. Uh, validated assessment is going to take that in consideration and it's going to be uploaded to the high trust mycsf so one of the benefits i've seen of of collecting this evidence uh, back when i was doing it operations i would have my team build kind of wiki pages or, or a how-to document okay go in there and take some screenshots and create a how-to document so that when you take vacation even i could get in there and manage it or look up a report well, a lot of those screenshots are gonna look like what you're gonna provide as evidence. So your evidence screenshots of your portals and your web pages may lend itself to building these process and procedure documents, which are not coincidentally gonna be required for uh, an R2, because an R2 is gonna test, hey, let's see what your processes and procedure documentation looks like. Well, here you go. Here's some screenshots, and then here's some verbiage around that. <clears throat> So this exercise helps you to build those uh, process and procedure documents. All right, and then the last question we have here um, is what should we look for in an in, uh, in a external assessor? Um, I could share some of my thoughts and Gary, feel free to, to jump in as well. Um, you know, the first thing is uh, quality of service and, and trust. Uh, you want a, uh, an audit partner that you can work with, communicate well with, um, have trust in. Um, so definitely get to, to know the persons that you'll be working with. Um, you know, the second thing is, are they technology enabled? Are you going to be submitting evidence through spreadsheets? Are you going to be using email? Is there ways for them to reduce the compliance burden? of doing single or multiple assessments. Um, those are important things to consider as part of your you know, overall cost benefit analysis. Gary, you have other ideas on that? Yeah, I, I like what you said about technology enabled because I'm just thinking of operating out of a spreadsheet, dropping stuff in SharePoint or, or Box, Dropbox. Uh, that, that opens up a whole additional level of risk. But additionally, um, I would look for a firm that while they, they have specialists in high trust, but they also have some other uh, skills across other frameworks, but they're not a, hey, we do everything. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you want to look for, for a firm that's, that has expertise in cybersecurity, information security, privacy, and, um, and that, that's showing their chops over time. Cool. 
Awesome. All good advice. I'm sorry. I, I promised that was the last question, but we actually had one other come through. Um, so what has changed from high trust version 9.6.2 to 11.0? We could speak a lot about that. I think we, we yeah. addressed that a little bit in one of our last webinars. Um, so, you know, off the cuff, I think it's a much better alignment um, of the different product offerings um, in a way that's nested. So like we showed in that, uh, one of the original diagrams is, you know, E1 uh, is a stepping stone to I1, is a stepping stone to R2 if you choose to go down that path. So that was a major revision that High Trust made. Um, previously, there was incremental improvements under version 9, um, good improvements, but with version 11, that was a major restructuring of the framework, which uh, we view as a very positive thing. Um, so we're, we're happy to see that that, that got uh, done. Yeah, one, one of the big changes, they did have an I1 version in, uh, they did have an I1 in version 9.6, mm -hmm. but there the Venn diagram had some on, on both sides. There was some I1 that didn't feed directly into an R2 mm -hmm. and uh, vice versa. There was some R2 stuff that wasn't considered in the I1, whereas they've, they've aligned that very well, very wisely with version 11. And uh, one, of, one of the things I heard from High Trust was that someone asked, why did you go from version 9 to version 11? And the answer was to avoid confusion. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more about uh, our High Trust services, uh, Christian and Gary, well, where should they go? How can they get in touch? Um, best thing to do is jump into our website, risk360.com. Uh, there's uh, a lot of high trust resources there, some of which we highlighted. Um, and click on that speak to an expert button and that'll route you to us and we'll be happy to reach out and have a conversation. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for everyone on the webinar here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be sending out an email, uh, should be out tomorrow with the recording of the webinar as well as you know, links out to all those resources and everything. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a great rest of your day.